John Schmelk, Paul Dottino with you. The phone number is 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. Paul, it's good to see you in good old New Jersey, my friend. Yeah, how about that? We just spent some days out in Indy uh, looking at these prospects, and uh, now we're back here. And by the way, the weather is cooperating with us big time today. Though I just read there's a chance of a nor'easter blizzard next weekend. So Did you really? Yes, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but apparently some of the weather models are saying that's possible. So buckle up! Uh, glad we made it back from Indy before any storms got in the way. Yes, absolutely. And, of course, Big Blue Kickoff Live is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. We're going to try to get to as many of your calls as possible. You know, we didn't have a chance to take many last week. Sure. Uh, so we had some interesting ones at 201-939-4513. <laughs> we were busy, though, folks. Uh, yeah. Very busy. But uh, we'll try to get to them quickly as possible. You're Paul and I asked a lot of questions about this draft class last week. So I thought, Paul, rather than going through, like, all the numbers and where guys time and stuff like that. One, you can check out, we're going to record a Giants Huddle podcast um, with uh, Dave Severtsen. That's going to post tomorrow. If you want to go like hardcore, where guys, you know, timed in the draft and stuff, tune into that. We'll have draft season this week. I'll do that with Tony as well. But Paul, I thought it would be fun to kind of mm-hmm. start with the players and then we'll talk about what we learned, okay? Okay. So player-wise, either podium or... Things that were happening on the field, things you heard about interviews. What player takeaways did you have from this class in general? Well, I mentioned this, I guess it was on Friday during one of our Big Blue Kickoff live shows, and it just remains true. Uh, The polish, the maturity, the way that these guys conducted themselves, it was almost as if they had already been in the league for a year or two. That's just the generic feeling that I came away with from most of the prospects who were, as I watched them do drills, or as I was around the podiums and continued to uh, mill around the room and listen to these guys talk. I was incredibly impressed. And I guess the, the line that I said to you, John, is that there were so many times during the course of past combines where I would notate every once in a while, maturity, yep. polished, sure. poised. Well, now... It was the other way around. It was guys who weren't quite there who I would notate because the majority of the guys were so good to listen to. They were. Uh, these guys are trained up for this. They get it. Remember some older prospects, too, guys that are five Big or six part of it. guys. So I think that's Big part, part of, it. of it. Fewer underclassmen than we've ever had in one of these mm-hmm. drafts. So I think that's part of the deal. I'll just throw out a couple players. Um, Roma Dunze is really impressive. Uh, he wasn't spectacular in any part of the workout, but he was really good at everything. Mm -hmm. And the stories you hear about him and just everything he did, I think he's as safe as a top 10 pick as you can get. I think you know what he's going to be. I feel really good about him as a player. This offensive line class, Paul, just watching them do the workouts, Yep. not one of these guys that I think is first round worthy at offensive tackle did one of those workouts and I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that guy. They all did it. They all look just as athletic and just as good as I thought they would. And I was really impressed by it. And, you know, the wide receiver class is the same way. It's really deep. You know, you're going to get a good starting caliber wide receiver in the third round of this draft. You just are. And there's going to be seven or eight starting offensive tackles taken in the first round. And you're going to get a couple more in the early second round. So we thought those two areas were a strength heading into the week. And I think we walked away saying those two areas are a huge strength in this draft class. I will second that by saying that everything I anticipated going into the week was reaffirmed, and that goes across the board. Yeah, no one really surprised me on anything. I wasn't shocked. No, I agree. You know, the strong positions that we thought going in, you know what? It was confirmed. The positions that are not so strong going in, it was confirmed. I I did not come out of there with any, like, U-turns or about faces, John. Yeah. I didn't. And look, Paul, just overall, you know, this is the deepest I've been into a draft class this early in the process since we're doing draft season now. I've tried to, you know, keep up ahead of time. So maybe that's skewing my perspective. In terms of the strength of the first round of a draft and the top of the draft, this is... Probably going back to the Rashawn Slater, Micah Parsons draft class, which was also excellent Mm -hmm. at the top. And I think that was also Penny Sewell and and Jamar Chase, if I'm not mistaken, in that draft class, I believe. That this is right up there as one of the strongest top of the draft classes in recent memory. And we've had years before, and we've come back from India, and we've been like, you know what? 
I don't love where the Giants are picking. They might just be at the end That's of the year and you don't feel good about it. Mm-hmm. We, we've said that many times. We talked about the year uh, with uh, Thibodeau and Evan Neal when they were picking six and seven. Mm-hmm. And we're like, or what was it, uh, five and seven, right? Five and seven. And we're like, you know what? They might just fall out of that. And it turns out Neal and Thibodeau were two guys in that top group for us ended up falling to five and seven. But... This, I think the Giants are positioned very well in this draft class. They have two second-round picks and a strong class. You're going to get two really good players in the second round. And at six, Paul, you are getting a legit blue-chip player. Yep. When, frankly, most years at six, you're not getting one of those guys. There's none left at six. You're getting them this year. I I go even further than that, John, because uh, Joe Shane has said with conviction a number of times since the season ended that we have four premium picks in the top 70. He considers all four of those, which takes him through the third round. He, he has used the word premium picks, which tells you he knows how deep the draft is yeah. with make it players through the third round. And he also knows, as you just alluded to at pick six, it's not just there. The Giants needs offensive line could use a you know a big play wide receiver could use depth at corner could use a possible pass rusher could use depth at defensive tackle these are all positions where in those top 3 rounds you're going to have choices and if they need a running back Paul you can get you know by the way I'll throw out there there is a group I was not excited about this running back class they tested extremely they did well, well. They did well. But I still think they're third and fourth round picks so if you're at the top of the third round like the Giants are Top of the third round, you might not have your pick of the litter, but one or two of that group of six or so oh, guys sure. that you like are going to be sitting there for you. You if probably could do it at the top of the back. fourth, too, if you really wanted. You might be able to. You might be at the end of the run at that point. I think you're playing with fate a little bit if you wait till the fourth round. Bottom line, you're going to be able to get good players at a lot of these different positions. And I will add this. I'm so excited. I love the draft. I'm so pumped up walking out of Indy Paul. I can't even tell you. I'm I so got excited. you. Now, given <laughs> everything we just talked about, Logic tells you, okay, that this smoke coming out of some people in Indy that, oh, the Giants are investigating a move up to the top three. Let me ask you, folks, use some common sense here. We've already told you the draft is really good at the spots the Giants need in the top three rounds. We've already told you that. And Joe Shane is stressing he's got four premium picks in those first three rounds, the first 70 players who are going to go in the draft. What sense does it make for him to trade a whole handful of those picks to move up from six to three? It doesn't. Well, yeah. It does not. not make sense. Not if the guy you get ends up being your quarterback for 15 years and his next Eli Manning. <sighs> I, I, would, would I don't like see Would you like the next it. Eli Manning on your team? Uh, Eli Manning, in retrospect, sure. But I don't see it happening. I I don't have, see any logic here that says the Giants, the Giants are trading up. Have the Giants, None. How the Giants acquire Eli Manning again? They dealt the Phillip Rivers pick and swapped with San Diego. So they traded a lot to trade up to get the they franchise did. quarterback they for 15 did. years. And, and that worked out pretty well, right? Oh, well, yeah, but the team was in a different position. They were better off. What do you mean? In terms of the overall amount of holes that they had? You they know, were coming off a pretty bad Jim Fossil year. No, no, I understand that. I understand that. But the thing is, they were also coming in with Tom Coughlin as a new head coach. I'm, okay, and they believed that Tom was going to be a significant upgrade over what they had. I get what you're saying. And but, the coaching staff, too, was a significant upgrade. But don't say it makes zero sense when they did the exact same thing. I'll and take it back. They set up for a decade It and makes a half. 2% sense. <laughs> okay? Well, you better, I think, how about put it this way? If you make that move, you better get it right. Or you are in a you know what ton of trouble. I yeah. Think that's the Oh, way there's I no question. I mean, look what the Jets did with Darnold. They're still paying for that. I mean, three second round picks wasn't a killer. It was the Well, then, it's gonna cost you more now though. Then picking Zach Wilson on top yeah, of that. Yeah, really. The, bigger problem. The, the point is though, the point is everything we've just told you, the most logical path and certainly the most sensible and safest path is to use those picks. No, sure. It it would not be to move up three spots. And I'm gonna give you a theory. I believe it's the Patriots at number three who were floating around the rumors at the Combine to say, you better get up because the Giants are going to take a quarterback. You better come talk to Papa. Let's see what we can do about getting a deal. Oh, it might not be the – I don't think it's the Patriots. I think – I do. 
Well, I, well, I see. Here's the problem. I think the Patri- I think the Patriots will be picking a quarterback regardless, right? So I think because I think the Patriots think if they they move down somewhere into the top fifteen, they could probably still get one. All right, and this is a quarterback. They could, and eh, not one of the ones they want. How do you know that they don't love McCarthy or Nix or maybe Penix? Maybe well, they love them. That this is the perfect transition to what we learned at the combine. JJ McCarthy ain't getting by the top twelve of this draft. It's not happening. I don't know where I haven't gone through all his tape yet. I'm through about eight games. I'm going to finish him this week, and I'm probably not going to have a top ten grade on him. Top fifteen right now, probably now, probably somewhere in the twenties for me, or, or the, the high teens is my bet when all is said and done. But talking to people there and understanding the landscape of those picks from eight to fifteen, where you have the Falcons, and I think Paul Schwartz said it well on our show last week. The Giants. They're open to a quarterback, the way he put it. And again, this is based off his reporting, not mine. But I like the way he put it. They're open to a quarterback, but they're not desperate for a quarterback. Okay? Mm-hmm. You know who's desperate for a quarterback? The Atlanta Falcons. The Vikings, You know who's perhaps. desperate for a quarterback? Potentially the Minnesota Vikings. Denver. They don't bring back Kirk Cousins. You know who's desperate for a quarterback? The Denver Broncos. You know who's desperate for a quarterback? The Las Vegas Raiders. Mm-hmm. Those are four teams picking between eight and... Thir- 14, I think? We all, we, we all, I don't have the draft order in front of me. Do you have that? Yeah, I got it right here. I got it right here. So what do we got? So we got the Vikings at 11, the Broncos at 12, and the Raiders at 13. And by the way, the Saints at 14 probably are not out of the quarterback business either. I heard Raiders. a lot about the Saints so, maybe going for a QB at 14. From 8 to 14, you have the Falcons, you have the Vikings, yep. you have the Broncos, yep. and you have the Raiders. And by the way... And New Orleans is 14 right after New Orleans. Correct. So that's five right after, uh, teams Vegas. in a span of seven picks Yes, that are going to be interested in a quarterback. J.J. Yep. McCarthy's not getting past 15. It's not happening. Yeah, It's just not happening. And he was so good at the podium, he's going to... The team's going to love uh, it when they meet with this guy. And, and this is my bigger point. If all those teams know the other teams in that group are looking for a quarterback, you know what that's going to motivate the other teams in that group to do? Move up. Raise the price. To move up. Raise the price. So, I think an interesting team to keep an eye on here, Paul, and this might seem crazy, are the Chargers. They have a lot of holes. They're well over the salary cap. Mm -hmm. They're a team that wants to build now from the lines out with Jim Harbaugh there to be a physical team. That's true. And what, what do we just say about the tackle class? So deep. You can get a starting tackle in the 20s in this draft. Yeah. Let alone 15. You can get a top five tackle at 15, right? I think eventually the Patriots pick in the quarterback. I don't believe they're not picking a quarterback. I think they're picking a quarterback (laughs) at three. I think even Mm -hmm. after that, the Chargers will try to sell off number five for a team to go ahead of the Giants and the Falcons to select McCarthy. Well, again... That's still a team ahead of the Giants. I, I, in concept, I totally concur with you mm-hmm. that a team ahead of the Giants, whether it's the Patriots or whether it's the Chargers, I don't think it's going to be Arizona. I think they're going to take right. Harrison. But but either one of those two teams could easily dangle, oh, you know what? We got a shot at the quarterback. We know you want him. Let's, let's, let's pay the piper. And, and so... And that's what's going to happen. And that's, that's why, exactly how it's going to go down. And that's why, to your previous point, it's going to be expensive. Right. Because the, you're going to have multiple teams competing with offers against each other that are move up to... to, to you're giving that. me all the reasons why it makes sense for the Giants not to move up. I'm just painting the full picture for, for fans. <laughs> and and I love doing. it. No, and I love it. Picture. And that's exactly the point. And look, and, we're on, and, look and, and I'm... Am I excited about trading up? No, I'm not. No, but, you shouldn't would be. I, would I be... Would I listen and be open to it, depending on well, what you have to listen? Player? Absolutely, I you have to sure. listen, hundred percent. But I, I just think I think what we're getting is that that stuff because there were a number of reports out of Indy that the Giants were were trying to move up to the top three, and I don't I don't believe any of it. I really don't. I think it's all smoke coming from teams ahead of them who just want to try to inflate the price. All right, so that was the one thing I kind of got a feeling for. And let's do one from you, and then we'll get to the phone calls here, Paul. Cool. Thing that you learned that about the, about this draft class, or generally maybe even free agency while we were out at the combine. Well. It seems to me now, again, John. I, I, the pass rushing class. I'm just. I, I'm not excited about it. I'm just not. I mean, there are some second round guys that I think are going to be fine players, but nothing that. 
there isn't anything that that makes you jump out the bar. Though Dallas Turner's workout was pretty it was. unbelievable. But see, here's 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 what bothered me, right? It's really, a good. little bit. We went out there saying it's probably not that great of a pass rush class anyway, and that uh, Turner, uh, Latu, and Verse will be the top three pass rushers in any order. And right? all three of those guys performed well, by the they way. They did. They all did well. They did. Mm-hmm. They did. But. I did not get the sense from anybody I talked to, either walking around or the guests on our program, that any one of those three guys is a really good bet to even come up with double-digit sacks. I did not get that impression from anybody. Eventually? I did not. Or like maybe, right away? maybe eventually down the road, but not within the first year or two. I did not get the impression from anyone. Latu is the best technician of the three. Okay, he is, but that doesn't mean he's going to do it right out of the box either. No, I agree with that. And so, you know, I think it was Mike Tannenbaum, and guys, there's so many uh, uh, different people we talk to. You'll see them on the website yeah, over the course of the month. Tannenbaum's not up yet. That's going up today. Okay. Yes. I think it was him who had said, well, because of these other premier players who moved up to the top 10, that helped push the pass rushers down. I'm not so sure that these pass rushers would have been higher anyway in another year. I think Turner because they're ju- had maybe the chance maybe because of the athletic profile in Alabama, and you know we've seen Will Anderson, all those Alabama pass rushers play really well because of pedigree, right? I think he would be the only one of these guys that I would consider a potential top ten pick in another. Yeah, year. it's it's just I'm just I, I'm I'm real down on the pass rushing class, and and that was just another reinforcement that I got from being there. Paul mentioned it. Go check out the John Soto podcast. Podcast, folks, we had uh, one go up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday last week. Uh, a lot of good stuff. Shorter interviews, ten to twelve minutes. We figured with the with the one hour big big kickoff, so you don't want to have the huddles go too long. Uh, so check those out from last week. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the ones that went up last week. We had Daniel Jeremiah, mm-hmm. we had Lance Zierlein, we had Tom Pelissero, who was really good on mm-hmm. free agency. You guys need to go and listen to that yep. one. And then I'm missing what the fourth one was, Dom. What was the fourth one? We had Pelissero, we had Jeremiah, we had Zierlein. And I can't think for the life of me who the fourth one was. It'll come to me. Um, make sure you, you got you got one for me. What do you got? Was it Miller? No, no, no. Was Matt Miller entire... went on BBK. BBK. He went on BBK. We had one other one. It'll come to mind. Which we we did a lot of <laughs> interviews, folks. But anyway, go check it out. We have Mike Tannenbaum coming up this week. We're gonna have Cynthia Freeland, who was fascinating on some unbelievable of these conversation, of, of testing and stuff. I'm gonna try to get her on again later on in the process to do a deep, deeper dive on this stuff. It was that interesting. Uh, that's coming up this week, and we have Charlie Weiss coming up uh, this week as well. So make sure you tune in uh, to the Giant Settle podcast for all of those episodes. It's brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. All right, 201-939-4513. Let's go to Jason in New Haven. He will lead us off. Jason, I know you usually have eight points you want to make. Let's try to narrow this to one or two because I want to get in as many calls as we can. Go ahead. All right, all right no problem. Um... I thought you guys did a great job in Indy, so thanks for all the content you you know you guys put out. Thank you. It was really good. Appreciate so, that. Um, well, the two major points. Um, I'm with. Well, I'll start with the two major points that I'll get offline. Um, I don't know if there's been a in the last few years this this receiving uh, core in this draft. It seems like probably the best on paper we've seen in, in quite some time. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's very good, though. Every year I feel like we say we have a great wide receiver class. There's just so many of those players coming out these days. Right. Um, and I'm with you, Paul. I don't think we'll trade up. I I think one of those top three – well, let's exclude, exclude Harrison. I think, I think he's pretty much locked up for Arizona. I could be wrong, but I, I don't see him dropping past Arizona. But I think at six, I don't think you could go wrong with either a Dunze, if I'm saying his name correct, yeah. yep. or or neighbors. Um, I think it's just a. It, I think what's going to happen is what what do you want out of your receivers? I think both could be X's. Um, I think neighbors you can interchange him a lot within the slot and the outside. Rome is more of your prototypical uh, X receiver. So I was glad to see that he ran a great forty. I know there were some questions about his play speed, but I think that was kind of put to rest. So I'd be happy with those probably would be my two top choices if they fall to that sixth spot. And then my last point as far as quarterback, um, I don't think there is a clear-cut way to draft a quarterback out, you know, with the top three names. Um, but there are two names I wanted to bring up, and I'll take it off the air with your opinions. Yeah. Um, I don't know where this 
this guy will fall. But to me, I like if Dayball could get his hands on him, and that's Milton from Tennessee. Now, I know people say, well, you know, uh, he's older, Tennessee has a gimmicky offense, so on and so forth. But he has the prototypical size, prototypical height, weight, and his arm strength is, is out of this world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would like to see what Dayball would do with him. And as far as last point, with um, a quarterback I would like to look into, I know some fans may laugh at me, and maybe you too will, and maybe won't. Um, I've always kind of liked, and I'm going to say this name as probably a, a veteran guy we may pick up um, or look into. Um, I would like to see what uh, what you guys would think about us picking up Sam Darnold. Um, has he lived up to the billing of his draft status? No. But I think he has some really intriguing qualities and tools, and he's another quarterback I would like to see you know, what Dable could kind of do with him, um, at least as some kind of backup. Or, hey, if Daniel isn't ready to uh, start the beginning of the season, I think I don't think we could do worse than Darnold. So I wanted to, you know, hear your opinion on Milton, Darnold, and the receiving core, and I'll take it off the air. Thank you. Uh, well, real quick, I think Paul and I are both on board. Neighbors or Adunze at six. Both of us would be fine yeah. with that. And Adunze, by the way, at the podium, he was asked about playing the other spots, and he said, I got no problem playing big slot. And he did not, in not, Washington. Yeah, so so don't just think. I, he happens to be the prototype X. I, I totally agree. And if you get him, that's where you're going to put him. But don't think that he's unable to do the other spots on the field. Look, Daniel Jeremiah has comped him to Larry Fitzgerald. Larry Fitzgerald started as your prototypal X. He ended his career as a right. spot guy. So he did. He I did. think that's a good way to look at it. Uh, Joe Milton... Look, he checks every box from a physical standpoint. He's got a gun. Athleticism, he's huge from a size perspective. He's got a cannon. He, he claimed that in one of his interviews he could throw the ball 90 yards if he wanted to. I wouldn't put it past him. No, the guy, he, he's a monster. The problem is that he played a lot of college football, and the, the, the art of quarterbacking is not where you need it to be. So I think he is a bit of a project for me. He's a day three quarterback for me if you want to pick him. Fourth round, maybe. I think maybe probably closer to fifth round, to be honest with you. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do there, but as a developmental guy, as a day three pick, I would have no problem with Physically, that. he's very impressive. Uh, length, yeah. uh, no question about it. He's got size, very poised. I like the way he handled himself at the podium, too. He, he really... I. Here's one thing, folks, and I, I know this is very, very um, sketchy to a lot of people, but... This is one of the reasons why coaches say you want to meet these guys, whether it's at the CU Bowl or at the Combine, especially when you're talking about a quarterback and the kind of leadership skills and the kind of demeanor and the kind of presence that he emits to you. That's very important in the huddle. It's very important at practice. It's very important in the locker room. It's very important on the sidelines. This is part of that intangible thing that goes into the guy's folder. And I will tell you, Milton had that. Yeah, Joe Shane has said to us that meeting with these quarterbacks to get to know them is more important for that position than any other position on the field. Yeah. So, so I, I w- I'm with John. I would think he's a day three guy for anybody. And if you're looking at a potential uh, project, yeah, I, I would not turn him away. Yeah, and I would be fine with, with, with Donald as a backup. He's a young guy. Dave will get his hands on him. I'm he not a Donald guy, and I, I, don't know if, I don't know if bringing him back to New York uh, creates mm. a very good situation. It's a good point. You mentioned Trubisky to me on the road. I would take yeah. Sam Donald over Mitch Trubisky a thousand times out of a thousand. Well, in terms of ability, I would not disagree with that. But I, again, I don't know. I haven't talked to Brian Dable. I don't know what Brian Dable and Shea Tierney think about Trubisky from their time in Buffalo. If, if their review was positive and they liked what they could work with, uh, then he would be the better selection for me. But I don't know the answer to that. Well, yeah, obviously it's, it's going to be up to the guys they think is better. But right. If, if it was my preference, I would go the Donald way rather than the Trubisky way. At least You'd also in, have to pay more money, way. I would think, too. Donald is going to probably be a little pricier. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I agree with that. And, and he probably also views himself still as a guy who can compete for a starting job a little bit more than Trubisky. He might be a little itchier. Maybe that's all I'm saying. a little bit itchier. Maybe a little bit itchier. So, you know. Okay, that's all fair. No, no, no disagreement. 201 939 4513. Jay and Phoenix is up next. Hi, Jay. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, like you're talking about in the, in the previous caller, too, the smoke at the draft, I, I don't believe any of it. Who knows what they're going to do? They could trade up. They could trade. You know, I doubt they'll trade back, but um, they could be trying to set up to get the receiver they want. So it could be any number of those things. 
But um, the question I had is the story came out, um, I think it was before the weekend, about Darren Waller Mm -hmm. and whether or not he's contemplating retirement. And I just, you know, whether he, you know, I have feelings about how he did last year. It was his third year in a row with injuries and not a lot of production. Is there, uh, from what I heard from somebody who was talking about it, saying that there's a penalty if he retires to the salary cap as well as if we cut him. So do, do you guys happen to know, I know it's a tough question on the spot, but know whether or not which would hurt more, which would last more, how many more years would we be hurting from the Darren Waller contract I believe, if we cut him versus let him retire? Well, it depends if you if you let him go, if you designate him a post-June 10th right. release. Um, assuming you if you do, do make him a post-June 10th release, uh, the cap hit would be less if you release him because you would then spread that over a couple right. of years. If he retires, I believe all of the guaranteed prorated bonus money would accelerate into this year. Right. So the hit will be a little bit higher. Um, as far, I, you know, I read the same story as you did. I don't know where Darren is or, or what he's thinking. Uh, so as far as I understand, based on what I've read, it's still kind of up in the air. But he better make the decision this week because the Giants are going to have to then adjust based on what he he decides if there's in fact a decision to be made when free agency begins early next week we haven't seen waller since the season ended no so there's no way for us to tell and he did not indicate on that final day at least in the speaking publicly that he was considering this so yeah that's that's what i was thinking too so yeah thanks for the clarification and then last thing you know you guys are talking about jill milton again who knows what they're going to do with the quarterback but am i do you guys think that whoever they do go for, that you really got to get a guy who's got a strong arm for Giant Stadium? I mean, I, I, I think the new MetLife is it's similar to the old Giant Stadium where a lot of wind. Not nearly as bad. Leads. It's gotten worse since they tore the track down. When yes. they tore the yeah. track down, it's I agree not with that. still quite old Giant Stadium, but no. it's definitely worse than it was before. They I'd agree the with that. Down. But is it does it make sense to look for a stronger arm quarterback than some of these other guys? Because like I said, I like the idea of Milton in that he would be a developmental. Mm-hmm. It allows DJ to see if he can, you know, come back from an injury, try to ride this thing out, and Dable and those guys work with him, hire the new kid. Plus, I, I keep forget, feeling like we're forgetting about Tommy DeVito, who I get that, you know, maybe uh, celebrity 15 minutes of fame went to his head too quickly, but I still feel like there's some stuff there. He's a lot of fun to watch, and he, he's a decent player. I, I wonder if there's, I don't know, I wonder if we have more of an appetite to keep him as our backup versus, you know, all this stuff about quarterback to the smoke, the smoke screen. But anyway, I'll let you guys answer out there. I'm going to jump off. Thank you, you Jay. Great day. Appreciate the call, man. Uh, arm strength is important. I mean, I think everyone that's in this draft class that you would consider a guy that you would peg as a future guy that could compete for a starting spot. I think they all meet the threshold that I would have in mind in terms of you know what you would want out of arm strength for a quarterback. Yeah, there's enough there for any of the top eight to ten guys were who, you happy are, who with are here. Bo Nix's arm strength, watching him throw. I was okay with it. You're okay with it? Yeah, I didn't have any problem. I think. See, the one thing I will say um, about the arm strength thing in the old Giants Stadium, it really was an issue. Okay, it wasn't just about the wind; it was also about the crown that the field had. Because if you wanted to throw the ball outside the numbers, especially if you were going to the opposite from the opposite hash mark, you needed to really be able to get it out there. And, you know, Phil was able to do it. Phil Sims was able to do it. Jeff Hostetler was able to do it. Uh, even when Kerry Collins got here, mm-hmm. you know, he, he had a cannon. Kerry Collins, to me, had the best pure arm strength of any quarterback I've ever seen. And I go back to Tarkenton. Okay? So, um, that made a bigger difference then than it does today. Although I will agree with John, the last couple of years, now that the old racetrack is gone, there seems to be a little bit more wind in the building. It's still nothing near what it was before when I think it was a significant factor that you had to pay attention to. Yep, agreed. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. James in Georgia is up next. Hi, James. Hey, guys. What's going on? What's up, buddy? Um, y'all did a great job in Indy, like people have been saying. Uh, y'all had a whole lot of coverage and a lot of stuff that was said. Um, like during the week, I didn't get the call, but uh, was covered by a lot of your guests. Um, I just had a couple of things about the draft. I'll try to be uh, quick. Sure. 
one thing that uh, Joe Shane said, uh, that the new defensive coordinator was different from Wink and that he runs uh, um, on the way to the quarterback. They're going to uh, stop the run as opposed to what Wink did. Is there any uh, comps as far as uh, defenses last year that were successful that run that kind of style that you can uh, tell us about, like point two? Dallas Cowboys, um, for one. I mean, Dallas, Dallas rushes. The, they stopped the run on their way to the quarterback trying to rush the passer. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's okay. one. Uh, any other team that runs some of that wide nine stuff? I think the 49ers, to some extent, play their defense like that, too. Yeah. You know, they, they, they try to stop the one run as, as, as they rush the passer. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, quite frankly, you know, they don't have a ton of like huge bodies in there except when Jordan Davis is in there. They rush the passer first and they try to stop the run on the way to the quarterback. Yeah, so, their, their linebackers are subpar. Mm-hmm. So, so that, that right, doesn't work out right. so yeah, well for them. I don't it think does they have work. the linebackers for that. And I, I you know, and, and the ironic part of this is is that, you know, Wink and I think the way he referenced that in terms of body types, like Wink wanted a guy like Nacho and Ashawn Robinson here, they're bigger guys that can uh-huh. stop the run, mm-hmm. as opposed to maybe smaller, quicker upfield guys that the new defensive quarter might want. The run defense stunk the last two years, so it didn't work. So I'm more than happy to try to use a little bit of a different strategy there, to be quite honest with you. Right, right. And um, uh, I was watching the movie Draft Day the other day, like last week sometime. <laughs> it's fun. That and was your I first never, mistake. Uh, yeah. I hate that movie. Right, oh, right. It's, it's a, a fun movie. Really? It's a, it's a good movie. It's oh, great no, movie. It's the the like, trades that they make, though, would never happen in real life, just so that's you know. That's the problem. It's so unrealistic, I can't buy anything else in the movie. It's a, it's a fun movie, but the yeah. trades themselves are just, they're comic book. But the movie itself so, is fun. On how the scout try, you know, he sticks the the hundred dollar bill in the it's in the fine. playbook and everything. That's it's fun. Fine. It's fun. It's fun. I had my I had my guy uh, Chad Boswick in it. Rest in peace, the Chala. Yeah. But, um, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, with with that in spirit, right? If you had like bad information on draft day and a quarterback or somebody starts slipping, right? And say the scenario that you brought up earlier, John, where the Chargers get out of there and jump in front of the Giants and take, I don't know, the last good quarterback left or the last good wide receiver left, right? Um, these, would you stick and pick uh, for an O-lineman six, for an O-lineman at six, move back, or take, a, take the a wide receiver at six? Granted that maybe two of them might be off the board and the last one, last person left is maybe a couple guys that you're getting some bad information on you don't want. Well, James, here's the beauty of it. Uh, I mean, if and for me, if any of those top – and look, getting into the uh, combine, I said this. I was probably leaning more OT than wide receiver. I, I'm off of that. I just think – you give Neil one more shot, you pick the wide receiver, and then you kind of figure it out mm-hmm. from there. And maybe I'll jump back the other way before the end of this process. Oh, that's that's where I've been. And, but I'm going with the receiver. So, so basically, here's what I'm looking at this. No, 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 James, I'm not done. Hold on. I, 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 I want to actually answer your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I actually want to answer your question. So the good news is that picking at six, if any of those top three quarterbacks or any of the top three wide receivers there, I'm taking whichever one's left. So there, there's six guys. You're picking sixth. So... I'm good. Like, I don't want to move anywhere. <laughs> I'm just going to sit there, and whichever one well, of those I mean, six okay. guys falls in my lap, I'm taking them. And that's and, the, and and if they're all gone, then I get to Joe Alt. And if he's somehow gone too or, he, you know, you don't that's, like him, then I'm probably going to go Brock Bowers. And that's where I'm at. Okay, that's what, that's what I'm saying. So say there's the five guys and one of them you just now got, like, this bad information all of a sudden. You know what I mean? That just came up the last two days before the draft. Right. You know what I mean? Not like today. when Tunsil so, like when yeah. Tunsil had the bad video. If something like that happens, right. So, right, right, Joe right, Alt right. shows right up with the gas mask. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so now you're – so now I'm, I'm still pounding the table for Jaden Daniels, right? But now I'm like, uh, we, we have to move on. You're saying you would pick – Bowers or um, uh, you said Joe Alt instead of moving back and possibly getting a lot more as far as quarter, you know, I don't know, wide receiver or oh, I would no, I would definitely, I would definitely enter, I would try to trade down in that situation because I feel so good about this tackle class that I can get one in, you know between ten and right. fifteen, okay, and I I think Bowers might drop into that ten to twelve area too, so. Uh, yes, I think the first thing I would do, I, I try to get out of there. 
If I could, I think Paul mm-hmm. would agree with that. Mm-hmm. I've then, already talked about the, and, the th- fact that I'd be willing to trade down. And then that's kind of how I would handle that, James. All right. Well, the last, my last point is, what would the what's the trade value for the two second round picks? I think of like what is the best thing we can get for them, I guess, or the lowest thing. Paul, you have the, the chart. chart. Say we can get for them. Well, you, you're talking about approximately 950 points. Okay, approximately, because you're gonna you're gonna stick a little bit of a premium on it. So now those two, those two picks. Uh, if you wanted to trade both of those two, wh- wh- what do you want to do? You want to get back up into the lower first round? Is that I, what you want? Yeah, according yeah, package, to this package, package deal, according to this you, chart, you could get up to around the 18th pick in the first round. Which, by the way, I don't think you could in real life. Like, I don't think I don't think so happen. either. I think I don't think so either. I think you could probably get to around 25 with those two picks. Between twenty five mm. and thirty, that would 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 would, would be my bet. Here's the interesting part, and Thank I, you, I'm got th- thanks for the call. call. I want to go back. It's kind of something that that you referred to earlier, but didn't refer to. Going into the draft, if there is going into the combine, if there's one thing that really did surprise me a lot in terms of one player, it would be about J.J. McCarthy, because going in. People around the league who I talked to, and even a couple of scouts said to me, maybe he's late first round. Maybe. And that was as high as they would go to me. We get out to Indianapolis, and all of a sudden, there's a bunch of talk, oh, he's going to be top 15. And by the way, not just from a couple of people. It was all over the place. From everybody. It was all over. It was like smoke, just J.J. McCarthy's smoke filled the room. And these are people that talk to GMs, talk to coaches. These are people that are in the know. And suddenly, it's like, well, wait a minute. He's going to be top 15. And then even the last day that we were there, John and I both had some people say to us, oh, he's going top 10. And then you get people saying, oh, you know what? I even think the Giants could take him at 6. Hell, there are people that said they might have him higher than Drake May. So let's, let's Let's just say if there is one player who surprised me coming out of the combine, it's that J.J. McCarthy got into a rocket ship and suddenly went vroom, right up the board. More than any other player that I heard mentioned the entire week at Indianapolis. Agreed. And that blows my mind because I was talking to one of my football guys today, one of my veteran football gurus. Football guys. And he said to me, he goes, oh, that's ridiculous. Listen to the guys who were there before the combine. He is a late first rounder. Nobody moves up that far on the board just based on an interview or off of one day of throwing or doing 40s. Well, remember, we were told this before they did any workouts. I understand. And even did any interviews. I, I, I wonder how much of the combine stuff was more hype than real, but... We're going. To see, we're going to see. Now, I'll just say we're this. going to see the guy that said it to us earlier in the week. Who I put a lot of stock in is Dane Brugler, who does the draft for the Athletic. Yeah, he does a really good and job. He said he had he had him he had him. He, this was his quote: "I had him in the top ten before the season because I knew he did. top fifteen. Sorry, top, top 15, fifteen. Okay, before the season because I knew what GMs and coaches thought of him. Okay, and he's left him there. So he didn't have him in the top ten though. No, did, he did not have him in the top ten. Okay, so." I guess what I'm saying is right now, my biggest curiosity is where does McCarthy go? Does he wind up top 10, top 15, or lower first round? Because the variance on him over the course of the week really changed and skyrocketed more than any other player. Hey, look, teams get desperate. You know, teams get desperate for quarterbacks. You know how it goes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think what you said is right. Mm -hmm. You got a run of teams right there in the middle that desperately want one, and I think people are just looking at it and saying, "Oh my God, yeah, yeah, quarterbacks never getting through that gauntlet." Hey, Giant fans, take your fandom to the next level with the season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for 2024. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, including a meet and greet with Paul Dettino. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And while you're online and checking that out, go download Giants TV, the Giants connected TV streaming app. It brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free. On Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. It's a legitimate thing Paul can put on his phone for free, as opposed to the other things that are on there. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513.
<laughs> All right, let's go back to the phones and say what's up to uh, Scott in New Mexico. He's up next. Hey, Scott. Hi, guys. How are you doing today? Good morning. What's up? First of all, I agree with uh, your assessment. There's a plethora of players uh, coming out of the combine. Uh, but I still believe in Paul's theory to draft down uh, and get some more draft capital. Although, uh, getting back to the other caller's point, does it become an automatic uh, if Darren Waller retires and Brock Bowers is there, they take him at the No, spot? no, 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 no. Absolutely. I don't think so either. It does not. Like, okay. I, like I said, Scott, for me, he's behind those six, the, the three quarterbacks and the three receivers. So... For me, that that is and all for that matter. So that does not become automatic. And there's other offensive tackles I like too. Right. Uh, there was a surprise to me in the combine that I didn't expect when I was watching players. I wanted to get your assessment of him, and that was Braden Frisk, uh, the Florida State uh, defensive tackle at Florida State. I went back and looked at his final year. He had 43 tackles, nine for a loss, six mm-hmm. sacks, five quarterback hurries. And if you looked at his arms, I've, I've really seen a guy with arms that huge. But a player like that or any player um, that you saw on the draft, how does that change the feelings of the people that are looking at him as far as a giant coaching staff? Does he fit a profile because they need a defensive line? Yeah, I, I would say Fisk shouldn't have changed any minds. Because if you watch okay. him at the Senior Bowl and you watch his tape during the year, that was the type of player that he was. He was athletic. Okay. He was an up-the-field, frenetic type of rusher. So while his testing was fantastic, 4-7-8-40, a 16.8 split, he jumped right. well, just 6 feet tall. Just 292 pounds. That's going to be something teams are talking about, too. But to me, the Combine, Scott, is about do you meet expectations? Okay. And I, and I expected Fisk to really test well, and he did. Yep. Was he maybe a little bit better than I thought? Sure, but he's exactly the type of player I thought he was heading into the Combine. He's going to be a late second-round pick. He's that type of pass rushing three technique, which the Giants do need. Yes, with, they do with their second second round pick. That I think Ooh. could appeal to teams looking for that type of player. He okay. was very very astute in his uh, media availability. Oh, I talked to him one on one at the Senior Bowl for like five or six minutes. He's a great person. He really is. He's a great locker room guy. A in, in older, right. but good. In some ways, do you do you remember Scott Eric Howard? No, I don't. Okay, never mind. I'm okay. I'm, I'm going too far back. It's all right. But but I think I think this I think this guy this guy's going to be a player. I I, okay. I I just sense that some of the measurables in terms of the height and the width and the size. Some people may be a little bit down on him. This is one of those guys who who he's got a lot in here. No, he's got a lot of heart. I yeah, I, I like him okay. a lot. Okay, last question. Uh, there was a lot of speed by the wide receivers. Uh, obviously, Xavier Lowry uh, set the record. I guess and uh, beat John Ross, but. Uh, speed doesn't always mean you're a great receiver. How right. do you view how do you view the receivers that you looked at in regards to who you might want to draft uh, that will be available to the Giants? And again, I'm still of the theory that Paul's right, and you need more draft capital by drafting down instead of up. But I want to get your perspective specifically on the speed of the wide receivers because I was impressed with Brian French. Uh, I guess Malik Neighbors and uh, Brian who? Uh, 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 the the guy the, from LSU, Thomas. Brian Malik Neighbors, Thomas. Thomas. Brian Thomas. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian Thomas. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. And and where the Giants might fit to get that really class receiver that they need if they don't go the route of getting a Dunze or a Malik Neighbors. And I'll take it off the air, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. No, look, the wide receiver class is awesome. I mean, I could list ten guys here that I think will there's be a good bunch. NFL there's a bunch of good ones in year one. I mean, you get past the top three. To me, the next group is A.D. Mitchell and Brian Thomas. I think they're relatively close. People talk about Worthy's time at 4-2-1. Yeah, crazy impressive. How about Thomas and Mitchell, who are 30 or 40 pounds heavier than him, and ran in the mid-four threes? That, to me, is more impressive. So those two guys will be first-round Worthy's a pipe cleaner. Worthy is... Seriously. He's Jalen Hyatt. He the uh, same exact body type. Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a he's a rail. There, to me, that's why I don't think Worthy's a fit for the Giants because they drafted. I don't either. They drafted Worthy last year and Jalen Hyatt. Same guy, same guy. Except Worthy probably was a better receiver in college than Hyatt was, which is why he's going to be a late one, early two, rather than Hyatt who dropped to round three. I like Tony Franklin. Troy Franklin. Troy Troy Franklin. Yeah. Yes. Troy Franklin. I agree. I think I like and, Franklin. He didn't have a great combine, by the way. He was just okay. Hey, four four one's pretty good. Yeah, but in terms of the drills, yeah, catching yeah, drills yeah, and stuff, okay. he was a, he was a little, little sketchy. And I thought Ad Mitchell was actually a little sketchy in those two. Yeah, Franklin kept falling. 
kept slipping. I don't understand what happened. Maybe, maybe he had the wrong shoes or something for the surface. I don't know. But Whatever. I that but I, I like I like Franklin a lot. No, I think Franklin's an end of first round, early second round pick. Uh, you want to go to like the the guys that can play inside outside. Lad McConkey was phenomenal. Roman Wilson mm. was excellent. Ricky Pearsall was phenomenal. Uh, those guys were all really good players. I'm not even looking at the list. It's just off the top of my head, folks. Um, let's see. What are the receivers? Jalen Polk really I liked. Jalen Polk. I thought Jalen McMillan, his teammate, was also very good from Washington. They were good players. Uh, Burton from Alabama, I thought, showed a little something. He was pretty good. Uh, Xavier Leggett, if you want a thicker run after the catch guy, you want a skyscraper, Keon Coleman. He ran in the four sixes. Uh-huh. But, again, if you want a big guy in the second round, he's a guy. If you're looking for an X, you can do that. So, I mean, I just listed 10 guys for you right away yeah. that I think are round one or two picks. There's, there's got to be guys there. You don't have to take a receiver at six to get a good one. But if you want a primo, there's only three of them. I think that's pretty much agreed, John. I didn't see anybody else say to me that there was another receiver who belonged in the top three to displace one of those guys. Thomas and Mitchell aren't there yet, but they have the physical traits to become one with the right coaching is the way I'll put it. Yeah, Thomas for sure. And Mitchell too. Yeah, you might. 210, 435, mm-hmm. 6, 2 and a half. Yeah. Checks every box from a physical standpoint. Yeah. So, 201 939 4513. Let's go back to the phones and say what's up to uh, Marco in Connecticut. Marco, what's going on, man? How are you? Paul, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you, Marco. Hey, great. Um, uh, thank you uh, for last week. Great content. I always look forward to it every year. And, uh, you guys don't disappoint. It just gets better and better. It is my favorite week of uh, shows every year, Marco. I love doing it. <laughs> yeah, what a blast, man. Um, and then, uh, oh, here's my question. My question is uh, actually going back, you did a Giants huddle a few weeks ago with Steve Cohen. Yeah. Right? And uh, it was great. That was a great listen as well. And he mentioned something that I, I was like, you know, I, I want to get uh, John and Paul when they're on and get their opinion on this. He brought up Jordan Love. And he was talking about the Packers on what, you know, they have a team right now and they found their quarterback and uh, how Jordan Love, basically alluding to that Jordan Love sat for a few years and now they have their guy. And I wanted to give you guys' opinion. What do you think about that in general? Do you, are, do you lean on if a team drafts a quarterback that – you got to maximize the years with the contract and get him in as soon as possible. Or do you think – I'm not even going to say there's value. Of course there's value in waiting. But do you lose it? How do I want to frame the other part of the question? Basically, do you think a quarterback should wait? Or do you think there's too much benefit of of the rookie contract that he should play right away? You're not uh, – And I'll take, it, I'll take it off there. Thank yeah. you, Marco. Good. Ahead, Excellent question. I think waiting is fine. I think the Packers waited too long. Now they have Aaron Rodgers. It's not. I mean, they waited <laughs> MVP. I mean, what are you I'm not do? saying they did anything wrong. Uh, I would have no problem, even if the Giants drafted a quarterback at six, let's say, for Daniel Jones starting the season as a starter and let the guy figure it out for a few games and see where you're at. I don't think you have to play him in week one of year one. I think. By year two, I would want that guy to, if you're picking him in the top ten, I would want that guy to be my starting quarterback. Ideally, by the end of year one. Look, you're not winning a Super Bowl with a rookie quarterback in his first year anyway. I know Roethlisberger, they almost did with the Steelers, but that, yeah, that, it's an aberration. That That's never really going to happen. So, for me, I think you work him in at some point late in his first season, ideally. Um, assuming what's going on in front of him with the offensive line is okay, and you're not going to mess the kid up by putting him in there in front of a bad front or anything like that. But I think by year two, if I'm drafting a quarterback high, I would want him to be my starter. Yeah, I, I'm against playing the uh, the rookie quarterback in the first year. I always have been. I mean, look, what Eli got here, even after they made that huge trade, they originally didn't want to play him, and Kerry, uh, not, uh, Kurt Warner was the quarterback. And then uh, at one point during the middle of the season, Tom Coughlin decided that he wanted to make the change. He thought there was going to be more upside, and quite frankly, he got a little tired of Kurt Warner holding the ball too long and with Kurt Warner's fumbleitis. And so he decided to make the change earlier than, than I would have. And if you recall, Eli had a dreadful last month of that season until the final game. Uh, so, I, you know, to me, if the Giants do take a quarterback in this draft, even if it's six, that guy's not playing as a rookie unless he's forced to. 
as far as I'm concerned. I want the guy to sit. Well, I want him to learn. I'm going to let situations dictate it, though. Like, if they get to a point and Brian Dable says, this kid's awesome and he's ready to go, then put him in. Well, like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not marrying myself to a plan independent of where the guy is. I'm going to trust the coaches to know when he's ready. Well, that that's really a double-edged uh, uh, question, though. It's got to be, is he ready and how is your current guy performing? If your current guy's got a 6-1 and one record, no matter how good the backup looks, you're not putting him in. Of course. So, so well, I'm, 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 I guess my larger point, let me rephrase that. To an extent, I'm going to let circumstances and what I'm seeing with my eyes make that determination. Oh, well, as with we. The new guy and with the old yeah, guy. Yeah, well, because it's a spider web. You don't make these decisions in a bubble. So I won't say concretely the guy doesn't play, but my first preference is for the rookie not to play unless circumstances force me to do it. And. A good circumstance would be if my starter gets hurt or my starter gets off to a one and six start. Those would be circumstances that would certainly put you in a position to, to do it. I get that. You have to be able to be flexible and deal with the situation that's dealt to you. So, uh, but in general, I would prefer to have the guy wait and learn. And quite frankly, you could wind up with a situation like San Francisco where. Purdy winds up playing, he does well, and they wind up trading the guy. Trey Lance gets dealt to Dallas. You know, I mean, who says that that guy you take winds up being the guy? Now, the problem with Trey Lance, he got hurt. I mean, there's nothing I know. to know about that. I know. But so you never know. I mean, it's not such a bad idea if, if you wind up. Look, even with the, the 49ers years ago, they had Montana. They brought Steve Young back into the league after he did well in the USFL. And, you know, he, come, he comes back. And then a year or two later, boom, Montana's the one that's out, and Young winds up being their quarterback, and they want, you know, so you can always wind up getting something for one of the quarterbacks in that scenario. There was some mystery today, by the way, with Jason Kelsey's press conference. He did, in fact, announce his retirement, Tom. Is that correct? He did? Okay, so Jason Kelsey is retiring. Congrats so. on a great career, Jason. So long. Thank you for torturing the Giants for the last 10 years. Exactly. <laughs> oh, by, and by the way, we should send condolences out to the Chris Mortensen oh, family and friends. Absolutely. Um, I've always said that if you had a Mount Rushmore of NFL uh, media people, Will McDonough, uh, Chris Mortensen, and to me, Peter King would be the three guys for sure. And I'm not sure who the fourth guy is yet. I don't know that somebody has earned the fourth spot on my Mount Rushmore, but those three guys would certainly be on that mountain. Would you care for a snarky answer? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, no, anyway. I, know. I was going to make a, a, a joke, but I don't want to take shots at people. Um, and I, I agree. I think all three of the guys you chose are excellent mm -hmm. choices. That wasn't in reference to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, uh, and, and I'm sure Kelsey will has his agent fielding phone calls from networks about getting him on their oh, programming yeah. as we speak. And someone's probably going to call him in a few months asking him to come out of retirement, too. Yeah, that's possible. Don't be shocked. Yeah, something tells me. Once Jason Kelsey lets go of the rope, not he's not doesn't seem like a guy that's going to stay in football shape for yeah, very long. I think he'll be done too, but someone will call him. Someone will call him. And again, that might that might be one of two things: either the weight balloons. I think more than likely is that he's going to get really tiny, like Sean did and Chris Knee did, and he's he he feels <laughs> he feels like a guy to me that has to work hard to keep that weight on. He's not the biggest guy in the world. Uh, yeah, probably. So we'll see how that goes for him. But excellent career, future. I'd say probably future Hall of Famer. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't make him a first ballot guy for me, but I think he is. I think I probably I think he would. Is a future Hall of Famer. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent player. 201-939-4513. Marty and Manahawkin. What's up, Marty? Hey, how you doing, guys? Uh, I uh, I'm a little surprised that uh, you know, looking at the rankings, how uh, the wide receivers. I was a little surprised that. Uh, Isaiah Worthy wasn't uh, up there a little higher than him. You know, there weren't even there wasn't even any talk about him. But I I had seen him play uh, out in Texas at Darrell Royal Stadium, and I, I I followed that kid since he's a freshman. I mean, people had and, him as a late first round, early second round pick, even before the combine. Yeah, I thought he might have even been a little higher than that because all he did was catch the ball out there in Texas. Well, he and, had a lot, but until this year, Marty, he had a lot of drop issues until this season, mm -hmm. and he weighs 170 pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't realize he was that light, but it, it is funny because when when, when I seen him run, uh, yeah, his his he didn't have he didn't look like he had like a runner's legs, you know, get a track star legs, you know, but he was. Uh, you know, he. 
I mean, he shocked everybody, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, we all expect him to run fast. I mean, the fact that he was the fastest wide receiver was not surprising at all to me. But, I mean, 4 two, one is ridiculous. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if we'll, <laughs> it's going to be a while, I think, before we see that. But, you, ne- you know, you never know. Remember, though, John Ross uh, ran a 4 2 2, and that NFL career never went anywhere. So, there, you know, just running a, t- a really good 40 does not necessarily mean you're going to be a great wide receiver. And Ross was a much uh, more diminutive wide receiver, too. John Ross. Well, Johnny, a good thing was Johnny Lamb Jones. He was supposed to be the next Homer Jones, right? Yeah, right. How'd that work out for the Jets? <laughs> well, all right. And, and I just wanted to say I was sorry to hear about uh, Chris Mortensen because uh, he, he seemed like he was a stand-up guy. Yeah. Mort, Mort was uh, the real deal, man. Thank he, you, Mort. Everybody in the league loved him. So. I never heard one person say a bad thing about Chris Mortensen. Yeah. No, no you're right. You're right. Real quality guy. Uh, I never actually had a chance to sit and talk with him at length, ever. Saw him a number of times at different events. Um, but he was always so busy, <laughs> you know, because everybody loved him. Everybody got a piece of his ear all the time. It was kind of hard to uh, to get him in a corner. Yeah, in those early ESPN days, it was him and John Clayton. Those are their two oh, my goodness. NFL guys. Yeah. I think John, is he still doing radio in Seattle, John Clayton? He passed away oh, a couple right. years ago. He did pass away. I forgot about that. Yeah, that was, right. another, that was another big loss, too. I forgot about that. That's right. And I, and I got great respect for John. I just that when, you know, there's only so much room on the mountain. And I can't, I can't quite put John up no, there. I understand. I wasn't taking a shot at John Clayton. Okay. I love John Clayton. He's great. Yeah, McD- McDonough, great. Mc- McDonough, and and Mort were the two guys. You know, going back to the golden era of the NFL, going back some decades now. Those are the two real stature uh, guys of stature who just dominated. Uh, you know, McDonough was a very, very, very close confidant of Bill Parcells too. All right, let's go to Len in Columbia, Maryland. He will wrap us up today. Hi, Len. Hey, yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for the coverage. Uh, Paulie, thanks for the memory of Eric Howard. <laughs> heck, of a, heck of a football player. Heck of okay. A football player. He's still alive, though. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no. I, well, I meant... Uh, <laughs> well, when you, you know, said it, it kind of said... It, it came off a little... It, it came off a little uh, the other way. So we're just going to tell people uh, he's still alive. I, I, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how um, uh, it happened, but... Uh, I wound up being close to the defensive lineman up at Pace during one, one uh, uh, you know, practice uh, period before the season starts, and uh, uh, he just he got off the ball so quickly. It yeah, was, it was unbelievable. And and, and he and Fist does that. If you yeah, watch him at yeah. Florida State, that's the kind of player he is. Yep, yep, yep. Terrific player, um, John um, wo- uh, Worthy, one seventy. I thought his combine weight was one six five. Uh, I, I don't have the number in front of me. I have to check. I think it was one six five. Either way, but, very but, very so, light. <laughs> let's 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 assume it was one seventy. Uh, any general manager who drafts a one hundred seventy pound wide receiver in the first round is going to be sitting in the stands in the very near future. How's, I mean, that's that's ridiculous. How's Howie Roseman doing? Uh, say again, John. I'm sorry, I missed the name. How's <laughs> Howie Roseman doing? He drafted Devonta Smith in the first round. That seems to be going pretty well. Yeah. Would you take the chance again on that? Devontae or, Smith, uh, yes. I said yeah, I would take the chance. Well, then I think yeah, he's a yeah, really good player. Yeah. Truth Devontae be, Smith tr- is a much right. better player okay. than Xavier Worthy. Truth okay. be told, I was always well, a Jalen Waddle guy, uh, and I don't okay. run away from that. I was always a Waddle guy first. He's you know that. Too. I know. Waddle's been awesome I know. Too. I know. I guess you guys are better general managers than I am, but I'm not drafting a 170-pound guy in the first round. Okay. That wide receiver. All right. Here, here's my wish list. Um... You know, up up to this point, this is what I'm. If um, if those first three quarterbacks, or one of those first three quarterbacks are there, I'd be tempted. But I'm I'm not I'm not spending the sixth pick on the fourth quarterback. I'm, I'm just that's I'm just not doing. That. I get it. I get that. I don't um, think anybody would land. To be frank with you. Well, I don't know. You know, I haven't heard anybody say anything bad about McCarthy. I mean, has anybody said anything bad about McCarthy? Well, because I mean, holy cow, he I mean, he has he has presence, he has intelligence, he interviews yeah. extremely well. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot to like. I'm not I'm not saying that 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 you want to downgrade this guy. I'm simply yeah. saying that going off tape before we got to the combine and listening to football people that I talk to around the league all the time, he was yeah. not a top fifteen guy outside of what John mentioned with Dane Brugler. That's it. I, I didn't hear anybody else tell me that. And yeah, then all of a yeah. sudden, now he is. 
yeah. I, I get yeah. a little skeptical well, when that happens. Now, I, I know there's, there's a, not a, a lot of loyalty involved, but his old, his old college coach said he was the best quarterback in the draft. <sighs> What college coach doesn't say that about his guys? Yeah, okay, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. And I wouldn't be listen. I wouldn't be shocked if Atlanta took him at seven. Eight. Wouldn't be shocked. They're at eight. Wouldn't be shocked if they don't make the trade for Fields. Um, all right. Here, here's my wish list on the on the Jeff. That's in the, 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 this is today. If Odunzi is there, I I just don't know how you can pass on it. Um. Maybe Harbaugh is going to grab him at five. I'll be very disappointed if that happens. I'd be but. shocked if Harbaugh takes a wide receiver, Len. Just, yeah, just the yeah. way he wants to yeah. play, I, I'd be very surprised by that. That's not yeah, his yeah, style. Yeah. yeah, I think he's going to pick Bowers. But good, that's okay, as long as O'Dunsey's there for us. Um, I'd like B.B. Uh, I like him. 30, at, uh, thir- is it 37, John? He's Thir- at 37. Uh, 37 or 38, 38, one or the other. Yeah, one of the other, and then I'd 39. like Jenkins. I'd like Jenkins from Michigan at forty-seven, and I want to stop the run. Chris Jenkins I mean, at forty-seven. Do you think he'll last that long? I think it's a little high. Yeah, I think I think that's a little rich for me too, Len. To be honest with you, I, I would rather pick a pass rusher there than than I would rather go like a Chris Braswell, a Marshawn Neeland, or if you want to go a pass rushing defensive okay. tackle, you know, maybe someone right. like Fist, something like that. Okay. Do Do you think he'll be there at forty-seven? Or you think he'll be gone, Jenkins? I think that's yeah. a. I he'll think, be there. I think I think he's probably somewhere between forty and sixty. If you really okay. want the defensive tackle, take Fisk in the third. Hey, he's not getting to the third. I mean, maybe he doesn't. I don't know, but that'd well, be better I'm, value I'm looking, than taking uh, right. Jenkins that high. I'm 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 still on this stop the run kick, um, and I'd I'd like to bring Ashawn back, and I'd like to see Jenkins, Lawrence, and Ashawn be that be that front three. Uh, listen, Whoa, Len, hold on, Len, hold on, hold no. on. Those, those guys are not on the field at the same time in no. this defense. No, no, they don't fit. Say that. Wait a minute. Say that again. Those three guys would not be on the field at the same time in this defense. You have two defensive tackles and two edge rushers. Okay, we'll see. I'm not okay. All right, I'll I'll go. Well, I don't I don't think that's going to be the case, but okay. No, let, no, no Len, I'm like telling you, Bowen runs a four-man front. Joe Shane yes. said he wants pass rushers on the field. Those right. three guys would never in a million okay. years be on the field at the same time. They don't fit. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to training camp to see how that plays out. Let me, let me tell you two of the names that just simply intrigued me. I don't know why. I don't know where they're going to go. Um, Baptiste from Notre Dame and Trice from Washington. Those are the guys. That for some reason, they just they just intrigue me. I I just I'd like to see them be available to us somewhere. Yeah, I somewhere think somewhere down. I think Trice with that second second round pick, I think would be a good pick. His field workout and drills weren't great. He had a lot of trouble with his footwork, but he is a powerful, relentless, straight ahead yep. type of rusher. Um, that'll just get sacks by just his effort, which I think is great, and I yep. think that's kind of like a good you know mid to late second round type of pick. Um, That's reasonable. And and then and then who was the other one you mentioned? I'm sorry, Len, besides Trice? Baptiste. Baptiste from Notre Dame. I have not watched any of his college tape yet, so I, I cannot give you an educated okay. opinion on him. Nope, okay. I don't either. Okay. okay. Um, f- finally, um, and thanks for keeping me on so long. Yep. Um, we got to sign Saquon. Don't let him leave the building on the first day. He's not coming back. Well, he's not going to be in the building, Len. <laughs> well, I, if, uh, well, don't don't let him leave his phone. Len, don't, here's don't the thing. If the Giants, yeah. I'm just telling you this how this is going to go. If okay. the Giants do not franchise Saquon Barkley, he will talk to everybody before he signs a contract. Right. Because that's the whole point. If you're a player and you get the unrestricted free agency and you don't get the franchise tag again. We'll see if the Giants use the tag or not. By the way, tomorrow is the deadline for the tag. Yes. We should have reminded people yeah, of that. Yeah. I, I figured that'd be a, wow. I figured that'd be a big focus on tomorrow. It will, but we should just let yes. people know. Absolutely, 100%. Wow. But so, you think that you think there's a chance to franchise Saquon? I mean, Joe Shane said it's he's not ruling it out. So I'm just going off of what Joe yeah. Shane said. I do I think they will? I would say probably not. But Joe Shane did not yeah. rule it out, so I will not rule it out. Okay. Well, Len, we... if he gets the unrestricted free agency, Saquon is going to play the market. All those running backs are going to play the market. Of course. That's how it's going to go. Well, let me. Well, well, let me be more profound than that. Yes. If, if if he hits the market, he's gone. 
I see. I don't think that's He's true. Gone. I don't think that's true either. Len, Len okay. I, there right. are there are a lot of top right. running backs out there. There right. are there are more running backs than there are teams that are going to be willing to pay running backs, mm-hmm. and that's going to drive the price of everybody down. So I think okay. I think there's a legitimate situation here in scenario, and I've been I think I've said this a few times on the air, yeah. where Saquon hits free agency, he goes around gets everyone's best offers right, and says, huh. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'd rather take, you know, I'd rather just go back to New York where I'm happy, where I know they're going to pay me right in the same neighborhood, well, do, and, well, do you and think, he'll go back. Well, do you think he'll hit free agency not knowing what the Giants want to give him? No, I think he'll know what the Giants are willing to give him, and that's right. why when he goes out there on the market and sees the other offers aren't where he wants them to be, that there's a good chance he would come back. Len, okay. I, I think I right. think ultimately... Ultimately, when you look at Saquon Barkley, yeah. uh, given his lack of consistent durability, given that he's 27, um, he is worth more to the Giants and their offense than he is to somebody oh else. Goodness. Oh, my goodness. Okay? Um, Seriously. Forget everybody, Paul, forget the everybody else. He, what he means to us. He's yes. No yes. I, I, I agree. No I agree. <laughs> I agree. And by the way, that's why the record hasn't been where you want it to be the last five years. And yeah, right. right. I mean, because they, they need more help. So okay. and, and so um, I think what will happen is uh, there'll be other teams that would like to talk to him, but I don't think they're going to value him at the numbers that maybe would take to drive him away. I just don't I don't think it's going to happen. If Saquon, I'll, I'll wind up real quick because I know you guys want to go. If Saquon is is gone, I'll be very disappointed. If McKinney is gone, I'll, I'll just be disappointed. Hey, thanks for taking my call, guys. Fair enough. Always one. good to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and look, we'll, we'll we'll do draft that you know today and tomorrow probably, and then the rest of the week we're really going to try to lock in on free agency here because that comes quick. This transition from combine <laughs> to free agency, it kind of <laughs> happens like that. So we're going to do the quick transition here midweek at some point. And obviously, whatever, guys, you want to talk about, we'll take your calls on whatever topic you want to discuss. But, you know, that switchover that we're going to have is going to be pretty stark, pretty stark and pretty jarring. And we're going to focus on free agency a lot the next couple of weeks. You know, even the huddles. We'll get some, a lot of free agency stuff, all right, for the next two weeks after this week is over. No doubt. And then, you know, once we transition back then – last week of March. We'll get back to the draft for the five-week sprint until draft night. And that's going to be kind of how this is because the Giants, look, they're going to be active for agency. I'm back, I'm back. You're on with tomorrow with somebody? Or no, I think uh, no, I'm not in tomorrow. You're not until Thursday then? I believe okay, so. Perfect. So Lance is in tomorrow. It's either with Casillas or Howard. I'm not sure which one. And then uh, I'll be back with uh, Matt Sytak on, on Wednesday and we'll start dipping into, knowing Lance, he'll dip into free agency pretty heavy tomorrow. Well, we, we've been telling, all of us, I think, over the last several weeks, I've been telling you, we think the Giants would probably target a guard in free agency. Yeah, and I could see them right? getting a pass rusher, too. And perhaps a pass rusher. Now, Whether that's a tackle or end. What's funny like is, that we've been saying that for weeks, and we I just saw a writer within the last 36 hours come up with this great idea. The Giants will probably look at a guard and a pass rusher in free agency. Okay. And I could also see... <laughs> All of you folks know because you've been listening to us for quite a while. And I think corner two. I think those are the three spots I what, think you're going to want to add to in terms of free agency. Yeah, the question becomes how much, knowing how many corners are in this draft, how much would you be willing to go economically to get a veteran in here? Yeah. I think they'll get a veteran in here. I just don't know what level it's going to be. You can generally get slots... At a cheaper cost. Yes, then the boundaries. Boundaries are going to be right. expensive. So I think you would, again, this is my strategy. We've talked about this, right? You attack for agency at positions that aren't as expensive, right? So right. depending on what happens to McKinney, maybe you target a veteran safety. Target a guard. If you have to target a running back because Saquon's not here, maybe you do that too, right? If you don't want to just go through the draft. I would prefer the draft, but again, maybe you want somebody that you trust in pass protection more, a veteran that you've seen on tape. That's fine. And then the only... The only pricey spot might be pass rusher. Just because there's such a need, yeah. you can't just rely on the draft for it. So those would be kind of the spots that I would keep an eye on. And then, again, we'll have our list. We'll go through the guys to keep an eye on in terms of targets and things like that. But that would be my 
you know, yeah. modus operandi and thought we, We've thrown out a few names over the last few weeks just because of connections that we're aware of. But the bottom line is uh, it's going to be a busy time. It's going to be a lot of shaking and baking, folks. All right, that's Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. For Paul Dottino, I'm John Schmunk. Lance is back tomorrow with either Casillas or Cross. Tune in and find out which one at 1230 tomorrow <laughs> on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Thanks to Dom for running the show today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another episode of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Thanks for calling in. Until then. 